I'm Commerce Next co-founder Veronica Sontev, and our next session is How the Yes Adapted Shopping for Today's Customer Needs. Now, I know many of you know Julie Bornstein. She's had an impressive career in digital leadership that spans Stitch Fix, Sephora, Urban Outfitters, and many more. Through these roles, Julie has led the industry into the digital commerce age. And in this session, you'll learn about Julie's newest venture, the Yes. However, this session is not a case study on what can be learned from the Yes. On our prep call with Julie, I almost felt like she was painting a picture of what the future of shopping could look like. But before we get started, I want to play a brief video about the Yes. This is the Yes, a new way to shop that's completely tailored to you with hundreds of your favorite fashion brands. Tell us what you love and what you don't. The more you yes and no, the more we get you. We'll build a shoppable feed that's so you. No two feeds are alike. This is Shopping Made Genius. Download the app and shop in a whole new way. It is with great pleasure that I, entered, um, that I welcome to the Commerce Next stage Julie Bornstein, founder and CEO of The Yes, and she's being interviewed by Lauren Thomas, retail reporter at CNBC. Again, my name is Lauren Thomas. I'm a retail reporter at CNBC, uh, joined by Julie Bornstein, the founder and CEO of The Yes. Um, so, Julie, again, really excited to be here with you on stage today in real life. Um, you know, a lot of things to talk about, but I want to first give you an opportunity to just give the audience a brief overview of what the Yes is. I know we didn't, there was just that video, um, but for those that might have never used the app before, um, just kind of walk us through what exactly it does. Yeah. First of all, thanks for being here. It's so fun to be in person again. It's been a long time for all of us, I think. Um, so th those who braved it out, we're very grateful for those who are speaking. Um, so the yes, as you kind of saw and then heard, um, is um, really a shopping platform that is focused on um, adapting to each user. And so as we thought about the problem that we were trying to solve, which is we're all shopping, opening 10 tabs, going 12 pages deep in a search, trying to find the thing we're looking for, and every time we go back to the same site, it doesn't recognize who we are and show us the things that are relevant. Um, you know, that was kind of the promise of um, e-commerce in the early days. I remember when I started at Nordstrom in 1999, um, to date myself, and Dan Nordstrom said, it's all about personalization. And it was funny because at that time, we weren't really um, selling much. We didn't have most of our brands online. We didn't have a photo studio or, or, or copy for the products. And so I said, it feels like we're kind of not quite there yet. Um, let's get the business up and running, and then we can get there. Um, but the reality is technology has taken longer um, to evolve. But now is the time um, with AI and the way technology um, works today. There are lots of things we can do now that we couldn't do before. So the idea is um, each person fills out a profile, shops. Right now it's just women's fashion, but over time we'll add other categories and we'll include men. Um, and the idea is we understand a little bit about you and then as you shop, we understand you more and more over time. And we have a very large selection and growing and the experience is sort of unique for each person. And I like in our uh, one of the phone calls we had leading up to this event, I believe you told me that your business, you kind of equate it to a lot of the music platforms that are out there today, like Spotify and Pandora, because again, after you like click like on you know a song or whatever, uh, they grow to learn your music preferences and then can offer you um, different choices based on that. And I think that you kind of, that was a good way for me at yeah. least to kind of think about the business, but obviously with apparel. Um, one, one thing that I wanted to mention and I wanted the audience to know, so you actually launched the business during the pandemic. I believe it was March of 2020 and it was delayed slightly. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that? And did that for any reason in, in your mind, you know, us living through COVID and many people stuck at home, do you think that made maybe the yes even more relevant and, and that consumers needed something like that or would gravitate towards something like that to shop for clothes? Yeah, I mean, I think as we all lived through, there were pros and cons to launching during the pandemic. It was certainly not the plan. Um, you know, I think that it was really interesting to watch all the traditional retailers really speed up their innovation and all the work they needed to do on their sites. Um, and so, 
and you know, if you look at kind of the stats, there was about a like five year increase in sort of trends of people shifting to online. And I do think we've seen this in the past with sort of moments in time, that sort of trend is a step change function that will then sort of continue. So there's no doubt that being sort of in a, having a digital business at that moment, I do have some friends who were launching retail businesses at that moment and that was disastrous. Mm -hmm. um, then again, no one was really shopping for fashion or spending a lot of money um, on clothes. So there were sort of pros and cons to launching in that moment. I, in the end, it kind of gave us a feeling of our first year being a big beta, um, you know, where I think we got a lot of good feedback. We were app only, iOS, and we learned that we also, I mean, we were always planning to launch web. It sort of made us, um, you know, sort of very clear on the timing of that project. Um, and... Yeah, I think it was an interesting year for everybody. And, you know, I, I did feel like having a smaller team, we have 40 people on our team, it was definitely easier to keep everyone sort of engaged right. um, through Zoom, which I know is a huge challenge of just managing, you know, teams through Zoom. Um, so that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I want to talk about the fact that you, you were mobile first, always, in, in thinking. And why did you decide to go that route? I know I see the numbers and it, during the holiday season, you know, I'll see the stats of how many of purchases were made on mobile versus e-com and just how mobile con is continuing to grow. Um, and I would imagine that you hold that belief as well, that that will just be an even bigger shopping channel for us one day. Um, but yeah, why did you decide to, to go that route even, you know, without having a website on, on day one. Yeah. Um, I think we decided to launch with that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is just the form factor is so different and we really wanted it to feel native and the small screen has a lot of challenges when you're trying to do a lot of actions. And so we really wanted to make sure that as opposed to feeling like a website ported over to an app, we were sort of app native. And um, you know, I would say the second reason was very much because the trend just continues to grow in mobile. Um, and, you know, a lot of our competitors um, who are sort of the multi-branded retailers, um, you know, have, I would say, everyone has a mobile presence now, but it doesn't feel quite as native and organic. Sure. And so much of our interaction is around this yes and no idea, which is, lends itself so well to the phone experience. Um, what's interesting is I had launched many apps, you know, I was at... Um, really Urban Outfitters when mobile first sort of came onto the scene and then at Sephora launched the mobile, the first mobile shopping apps and the um, Beauty Insider app. And, um, you know, in those cases, and then with Stitch Fix too, we had web first. Mm -hmm. And so I hadn't had the experience of launching app first. And, you know, it, there were some great things about it, mm -hmm. um, that, but there are challenges with it. It's not, you know, for any commerce business, app is not a cost efficient way to acquire customers. Right, um, right. And so, you know, as we move to start to think about spending on marketing, our first year was really primarily just organic. Mm -hmm. um, we realized that you really need that as an, as an acquisition vehicle. Sure. Um, and we are still, you know, working on getting web up to par with app. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine for your business, though you might tell me otherwise, but stores, you know, not, not something that you would think about in the near future. I'm curious if that, that AI model could really transfer into, you know, a brick and mortar retail experience. Yeah, I, I think, um, first of all, I'm, my favorite thing to do is go shopping in the real world. So I don't think yeah. that's ever going away <laughs> and I don't ever want it to go away. Um, and I do think, uh, I have a few ideas for how we could be useful in the physical world, whether it were our own stores or our brand stores. Sure. Um, so I think that there's a lot to learn. We, we get, the way our app works, customer gives, tells us yes and no on hundreds of items mm -hmm. to every item they buy. So we have like 100 times the amount of data and signal from the customer. And so that is really helpful when you're thinking about inventory planning and where to put product in different markets. So I think that there is a lot of data that could make um, sort of, you know, deciding what inventory to have in which market more efficient. Sure. Um, but in the, you know, next few years, right. we are definitely not thinking about brick and yeah. mortar. Not we are excited to support our brands. We work with 250 brands, and when a brand is having an event, we're excited to, um, you know, sort of notify our customers mm -hmm. about the events in store that are happening in their area. Great. Um, so that's how we think about Makes sense. physical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about the, the AI as well. And, and I, I'm, I would imagine you get this question a lot, having been at Stitch Fix previously, and if someone were trying to understand, you know, the difference between Stitch Fix and kind of how their model works with their algorithms, and they have the, the stylist, you know, the physical 
human element, I guess, to you know them selecting clothes for clients. Um, but you really rely heavily on the yes and no selections. And I wonder how you know when you gather more of that data over time and you learn more about a customer, it, it just becomes smarter. Like, could could you walk us through that process? And again, how that you know maybe there's a, an easy way to kind of understand how that business is is different than what Stitch Fix does. Mm, yeah, I get that question a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. There were so many interesting learnings from Stitch Fix, and it's such an interesting business. Um, you know, I think that it is a different, very different business model than the Yes. Um, we were basically, as I'm sure most people in the audience know, with Stitch Fix, you fill out about a 40-question um, sort of sor survey, and then a stylist is matched to you, and they pick five items to put in your box. And so. Um, the also the model requires that you own the inventory so um, and because style is so hard to sort of really understand at an individual level it tends to work really well for people who aren't quite as particular about what they want and a little less brand sensitive mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of a different segment actually that um, Stitch Fix serves um, we think about kind of serving more of the fashion follower and fashionista, someone who spends a little bit more wallet share on the fashion category and who knows brands and is interested in brands. And what's interesting is, um, you know, with Stitch Fix, there's the layer of the stylist. So you don't, you know, you know of the five items in the box, what the customer is keeping and not. Right. Um, but there's a limit to the amount of data you're collecting. Mm -hmm. um, Stitch Fix has gotten very, you know, is very good at, it, at its model. Um, in our case, my interest was a couple of different things. One was the shopping experience itself. So, you know, we're really for someone who wants to have more um, sort of, you know, involvement in their shopping. Right. Um, it's very, very hard to predict five items that are going to be exactly what a customer wants. Like that just doesn't really exist. And, you know, also... I mean, one of the interesting things about the Stitch Fix model is people would receive something and would say, I would never pick it out, you know, right. but it looks great on me and it fits well. And I think that serendipity works well in that model. In our case, we're really focused on how do we use the shopping experience to really get much more information about the shopper. So what we did is in the very beginning, we built this very extensive taxonomy that understands every dimension of, you know, an article of clothing, a shoe. Um, and so we're capturing about 500 I would say dimensions that we sort of, you know, that we tag every product with. So our model is we work with brands, we leverage the brand's e-com inventory, so we don't own the inventory, mm -hmm. and um, we leverage their photo assets, so their photography, and we, you know, sort of ingest all of their product copy and information, but then we put each product through our own system mm -hmm. that then applies, and it's sort of this, you know, machine learning model that understands how to look at a photo and look at all the underlying data and then apply additional sort of tags to it. And that way we understand for every item, every sort of facet of that item. And then when a customer comes on and they fill out a profile, they answer, we spend a lot of time figuring out the questions that get us the highest signal data. So we start to understand what matters to them. And um, one of the things that we know is really important is also understanding what they don't like. Um, so we all have things where, you know, don't ever show me a crop top or an off the shoulder shirt. Like I just won't wear those things. Um, it's nice to be able to clear those things away. And then, um, you know, we have the ability to um, sort of understand what to show and start to learn more about the customer's preferences. And what we do is we started actually um, just asking if you, you know, start to say no to, you know, a couple of yellow tops, mm -hmm. we will sort of say just confirming you don't like yellow. So, you know, yes. you yeah. want to do, there's like sort of this combination of confirm, you know, guessing and then confirmation that you sort of blend together to make sure that you're learning the right things yeah. as the customer goes. Okay, yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you, because um, I cover at CNBC a lot of the brands, I would imagine, that are now part of your platform. What has the reception been like? From them, you know, to be a part of the yes, uh, and you know, those. What are those conversations like as you're looking to grow? I would imagine your your um, platform of brands. I mean, I think this came up in one of our prior conversations that you kind of look at this business model as a future department store, kind of the modern day department store of sorts. Obviously, in, in the virtual realm. Yep. I'm curious in the room how many people come from a brand. Will you raise your hand? Oh. Yeah, yeah, there are a ton of brands in here. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. When I started the Yes, I knew that 
you know, for, I've worked with so many brands over the years and I know how constrained everyone is with tech resources, mm -hmm. how the like, you know, wish list and roadmap is far longer than people have time to do. I also know the, you know, traditional um, sort of third party retail model because I was at Nordstrom and Sephora. And so, um, you know, my goal was to build something that was beneficial to both the consumer and the brand. Mm -hmm. I really, I've always loved brands. I mean, my, I remember so well when I was 10, I got a pair of Calvin Klein purple pants for my <laughs> birthday and a really cute rainbow um, belt to go with it. But the problem was the Calvin Klein label was under where the belt goes and I was torn about what to do. <laughs> um, and I would say, you know, I've always been a big, big lover of brands and believer yeah. in brands. And um, so, you know, I think that the goal was how do we make this a business that really helps the brands thrive, mm -hmm. um, gives them additional data that they couldn't get themselves, is easy for them to integrate with, is not going to require their tech team to have to spend time with us. Sure. Um, and, you know, helps them get new customers and more brand awareness. So we um, actually built a pro prototype of what the Yes would look like because we went out to market to talk to brands, you know, easily like a year and a half before we were going to launch. Hmm. Um, and so we knew that we needed to try and explain, you know, what was right. happening. And the thing is, we started with the luxury brands because we knew it's just much harder to go up than it is to, you know, That's go down. Point. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of, some of the early conversations were interesting because the more luxury brands said, well, who am I going to be next to and what are the other mm -hmm. brands? And we said, you know, this is really a different model. This is a high-low model. Mm -hmm. And what each user sees is a different mix of things. So if mm -hmm. you're, you know, Balenciaga you may you know, normally be seen next to St. Laurent and Bottega Veneta in right. a store environment. Right. Um, but in our case, you're gonna be next to a mix of whatever that customer tends to like and buy. Mm -hmm. And we get a really good early signal up front by asking brands, and we have high and low brands in our first screen, but we learn really quickly about brand preferences. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then it gives us the ability to suggest and explore other brands. And so the brands were, you know, I would say really excited. They understood that this was, we were a tech partner that was, you know, sort of forward looking and it was interesting for them to learn. Right. They were curious how the personalization for their kind of storefront in our mm -hmm. app experience would work for them. Um, they appreciated the fact that the integration takes about two hours. So we've done all of the heavy lifting on our side. Um, and so there's no management. It doesn't, there's no feeds required or anything like that. Right. Um, and, you know, I think that we're, our model is we charge commission for the right. sale. Right. So there's no sort of upfront fee. And we allow the customer to follow a brand on Instagram directly while shopping in our app. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of really fluid. Um, they can sign up for the um, the brand's email, mm -hmm. and we share really interesting, insightful data. Um, and our goal is really not to interfere with the relationship between the brand and the customer. The brand ships the product in their packaging, um, but you know the reality is, multi-branded shopping is definitely an important additional way for your brand to be discovered. And some customers like to shop that way. And so, you know, our goal is to help consumers you know, discover new brands. Mm -hmm. And customers love that aspect of it. They love when they see a brand they don't know and it's a great discovery. Um, but we are very pro-brand and, and, you know, our goal is to share all the data with the brand so they right. can be smarter too. It right. just helps us all, so. And one other thing I wanted to add, I know you're very proud of the fact that return rates are, are very low and I think that's something you've said in the past that you're striving to have like one of the lowest return rates in the retail industry and that's something that obviously retailers struggle with across the board is, is how to get those return rates down. I don't know if you could speak to that at all or I guess it's just, you know, the fact that as your, your AI, you know, capabilities become smarter and smarter, hopefully the customer customer will always like those items that they are, are receiving. Yeah, I mean, you know, usually the biggest reason that people return something is fit. Right. Um, and so one of the interesting things is we sort of built um, a universal fit map where we took all of the brands and we worked directly with the brands and then we also did, we have a fit specialist and we did try-ons where we needed to and really mapped out kind of where each brand's size run mm -hmm. runs relative to kind of everyone else. And so what we do is when you're um, coming on 
as a customer, you fill out um, questions around fit. And the most important thing is most people aren't, you know, just one size. They run between sizes. And so the question is, what's your primary size? What's your secondary size? And what's a brand that fits you well? Mm -hmm. And so with that data point, we have the ability to recommend the size for you for every brand. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, I think that's a really good, solid way to start. Where it's going to get even better is by having just more and more user data that we right. can sort of leverage to confirm our recommendations. Um, and so our return rate now is a little bit south of the average multi-branded retailer, mm -hmm. and we anticipate it going down, you know, regularly as data gets. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because brands retail sites tend to be a little bit lower than the buying that brand elsewhere because people who are shopping on the brand know the brand a little bit better um, and they're more familiar with it. But um, our goal is to be even lower than they have on their site at some point. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I keep thinking of just how one day I could see what you've done and, and kind of the technology on the back end incorporated in, you know, whether it's brands, websites, or apps, or even department stores somehow making use of this. I mean, could you ever see your business pivoting, you know, to help the needs of, of other companies. Uh, I think we, we spoke about how, you know, now when you shop on you know, Macy's website or a department store's website today, you'll, you'll often get a slider at the bottom that says, like, here are a few other things you might like or, or customers that bought this also bought. And I just think that that's, like, on a very, you know, dumbed-down level, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what they've, they've tried to do or replicate on their own sites. But obviously, it could be much, much smarter. Yeah. I have a little bit of a theory that, sort of over the next 10 years, the tech infrastructure of e-commerce will migrate to kind of the way our tech integration is built mm -hmm. so that every site can understand each user's actions and kind of adapt to them. I mean, it requires a one-to-one -one neural network. So you need sure. the ability to actually respond to each user. I mean, our app is adapting real time as you do things and no two experiences are ever the same. And that's a really big technical rewrite. And so like one of the things I was thinking about is with this model, could, you know, could we take it to, you know, I was even thinking about this idea in the context of going to join another retailer and I just sure. felt like we needed to build this from scratch. Yeah. But I do think tech is gonna continue to migrate and I do think this idea of, you know, a site that is, understands each user and is built to be responsive to each user will become mm -hmm. the norm. And as you said earlier, you know, it's how sort of a lot of the media sites exist today. So whether it's Pandora, Spotify, TikTok, YouTube, you know, they're all set up in this way that understand your actions, whatever those actions are in that, you know, world, whether it's thumbs up, right. thumbs down. or And so it has the ability to continue to adapt. And it's just not how e-com infrastructures were built. Yeah. Um, you know, Shopify, obviously, as kind of the growing platform, is probably the player that will need to figure it out. Yeah. Um, it'll be really interesting for those of you who are on sort of, you know, more dated infrastructures. It's just, you know, it's hard to, you, you have to work with a third party software provider who can sort of, you know, implement sort of sections of it. It's very different than having the entire system sort of built, built to be way. responsive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I know we're almost at, at time, so one final question I'll, I'll leave you with is, you know, as you look toward the future, like, what's what's next? How do you continue to grow and, and scale the business from here? I would imagine part of that is just adding more and more brands and, and maybe, um, you know, spending some more on marketing. I wonder if, if to raise awareness, um, that's, that's part of your plan as well. Yeah, I mean, we're in, you know, the first inning at best, so we have lots ahead of us. Sure. We're still quite small. Um, and we are very focused on, I would say, um, continuing to build out the web experience so that it um, is as good as the app experience. Um, we will, in the future, launch men's. Right now, we're US only, right. so we'll launch internationally. Um, I believe we could extend to other categories over time. Um, we also have a lot of, we're doing some work with Instagram, and I think there will be some interesting um, integration with nice. Um, influencers and other ways that you can get ideas about what you want to wear. Um, so discovery is obviously a huge part of what we think about. Um, and so, yeah, we have lots ahead. Lots ahead. Yeah. Er early days. Early days. <laughs> well, thank you again, Julie, for the time today. Um, and thank you for everyone who attended this one. Appreciate it. Thanks. And thank you.